how natural selection works. Um, mostly what we're ooh, sorry. Mostly what we're going to do today is talk about some examples of natural selection that are sort of interesting to um, think about. Um, let's start off with this one. What kind of animal is that? A peacock. Now, you seen those walking around before, like Nita Kazoo? Yeah. The one that you see that you call a peacock, does that, do all birds of that species look like that? No. Only what? The males. Only the males do. That's a peacock. Peacock is the term for the male. Do you know what the female is called? Peahen. Peahen. And together, they're called peafowl. All right. So, peahens. So why do the males look like that? Why do they have this bright, showy tail? Um, Caitlin? Yeah, to attract mates. Okay. The male's tail feathers help it to attract mates. Females actually choose their mate based on um, those tail feathers. The more impressive the tail, um, the higher the chances of finding a mate. The male, a uh, peahen, like males with those large, colorful tails. But what is this? That's the female. That's the peahen. These are the young. Why do they look just like sort of a, I don't know, turkey-like bird or something? They don't have a bright, showy tail or anything. Why not? Okay, good idea. That's not quite it. Nicholas? Yeah, there's no, because they are the ones that select the mate. They are not looking to attract mates. They choose the male. So this is often the case, lots of birds and some fish and so on, is that oftentimes the male of the species is bright and colorful, and the female is often drab, dull colored. You know what um, male or ducks look like? Yeah. If I say male or duck, you're probably thinking, what does it look like? Yellow. Green head, okay, blue stripe in the wing, um, sometimes a red band around the neck. That's only, though, male male or ducks. You know what female male or ducks look like? Brown and white. They're sort of brown, speckled, plain sort of looking ducks. It's actually an advantage for the females to have that coloration. Why? Brandon? Like, so they'll Yeah, it's camouflage because they are responsible in reproduction for laying the eggs, uh, protecting them, and raising the young until they become <laughs> independent. So for them, for the females, it's an advantage to be sort of dark or drab in color to blend in better. Okay? For the males, it's an advantage for them to be brightly colored. They can attract more females and therefore pass on those genes to the next generation. <laughs> and you see this with guppies and other sorts of animals as well. And this is, this is actually a special form of natural selection. This is called sexual selection, when choices and mates by, usually it's by the females, um, have influenced the course of uh, evolution of these species, and that's why you have brightly colored males. Uh, another example of natural selection. What kind of bird is this? Hummingbird. A hummingbird. Hummingbirds, what do they feed on? Flowers. Nectar from flowers. And various flowers have different shaped um, petals that lead to where the nectar is, back in the back of the flower. And when we study hummingbirds, what we see is that hummingbirds' uh, beak size is um, almost perfectly matched with the flowers that they feed on. And that's because of natural selection. Hummingbirds that have that certain size beak do better. They get more um, food, they get more nectar, that can, gives them more energy, they can live longer, they can reproduce more, and therefore pass on those genes to their offspring. It's so an example of natural selection. Hummingbirds that feed on smaller flowers have shorter bills. Some hummingbirds have really large bills to reach those uh, into those flowers. 
So to kind of summarize, <coughs> in that closed selection, any beneficial trait, any variety that is selected for, over time will become what? Drop time is what? Well, not quite adaptive. Will become more common or more abundant. Any variation that's selected against will become what? Rare. Rare. Or become extinct eventually. So we know that in natural selection, if you have hundreds of thousands of eggs, which ones are most likely to hatch, survive into adulthood, and eventually reproduce? Kimberly? Maybe, but I'm not sure. I don't know, possibly. Let's think more generally. The ones that are going to survive and reproduce are the ones that are best adapted to that environment. Best adapted will survive. What's that? Yeah. Oh, that's just a little uh, feature, a little animation. Sure. Oh, wait, sorry. I'll go back. Yeah, um, that's just, that's a uh, feature, that's me. That's just our curious Mr. Richards when I first got to know them. They weren't that nice. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Felt a little bad until a few seconds later. <laughs> so, wh wh how does that relate to natural selection? <laughs> I was well adapted to those surroundings. <laughs> However, Mr. Arcuri and Mr. Richards were not, and therefore, Better or found them fairly easily. All right. Who do we call the father of evolution? Which scientist? Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin. Can you talk about Darwin a little bit? Yeah. Yeah, he's on the front. He was a scientist. He lived in the 1800s. Uh, he actually. He traveled around the world in a ship called the HMS Beagle. And on that ship, his job, he was the ship's naturalist, which meant wherever the ship landed on, this journey took years. Wherever the ship landed, he would study the plants, the animals, the fossils, the geology of those areas, take very careful notes, collect samples, and sort of just study the science of all these different ecosystems, these different parts of the world. And as he made this trip, he started thinking about where these varieties of species came from. And he started coming up with his ideas about natural selection. Um, one place that gave him a lot of insight into natural selection were the Galapagos Islands, which are a chain of islands just off the coast of South America. And they're a series of small islands. Um, and what Darwin was looking at, one of the organisms, were these finches. Do you know what a finch is? It's a small bird. Yeah, it's a small little bird. Um, you see them all over. Um, they're very common. But what Darwin noticed about these Galapagos finches is that on each island in the Galapagos, the finches that lived on each island, they all looked pretty similar in terms of their body shape and so on. But there were Major differences in what? These are the finches. What's a major difference, Dan? Their beaks. Yeah, and their beak shape and size. So Darwin noticed this. His idea was that, well, these finches probably all originated from a common ancestor finch that sort of dispersed onto these different islands. But then because each island had different conditions, they all started evolving separately and started to develop different characteristics. What do you think those various beaks are adapted for? Why did they become different? Yeah? To be able to eat the yeah, because each island had slightly different food sources. And so over time, the finches adapted to eating those food sources. 
Um, what do you think? What are like thicker beets helpful for? Like this real thick meat spinach. We don't have any idea. What might that eat? Tom? It's a good guess. You're kind of on the right track, Kimberly. No? Because insects are small and you just sort of grab them. Yeah, thick seeds that had a hard um, shell or hard seed coat, like a nut. Okay, if you think about like a walnut or something. Uh, you have to crack through that to get the seed inside. Some eat fruit, they have like a sharp beak for getting through the fruit. Some eat large seeds, some eat small seeds. Some eat small insects, some eat larger insects. Some even eat cactus. And each beak is sort of adapted to eating those various foods. And so this is one piece of evidence that got Darwin thinking about how this happens, about natural selection and so forth. All right, another example of natural selection, antibiotic pesticide resistance. Probably the past couple of years, how many people have had strep throat in the last few years or so? It's pretty common, right? So when you have strep throat, you get a really sore throat, hurts really bad, doesn't get better. Um, you go to the doctor, they probably put that big long Q-tip thing way in the back of your throat, gag you with it. What are they doing when they do that? Why do they make you do that? Are you? They're trying to get all the bad bacteria out so they can so you get better. Um, not quite. They're not trying to get them out. They're really just trying to what, Nat? Get a sample. Get a sample of the whatever's causing your sore throat. Because it may not be a bacteria. It could be a virus causing your sore throat. Okay? So they take that sample, they do a quick test or send it to the lab for a test to see what's causing the sore throat. If it comes back that it's this bacteria, Streptococcus bacteria, is what causes strep throat. If they find that's the bacteria, um, then they can treat you accordingly. Now, what is the usual treatment if you do have strep throat? What does the doctor prescribe, Peter? Water. Maybe. What kind of medicine, I'm thinking, Kayla? Antibiotic. Yeah, an antibiotic, like amoxicillin, that pink bubblegum flavored stuff that probably you all hate. Um, that's an antibiotic. Antibiotics, a medicine that kills what? Not all germs, but it kills, doesn't kill viruses, it only kills bacteria. That's why they do the culture, to make sure it's a bacteria causing your throat. So when you have strep throat, you have a colony of these bacteria living inside of your throat, damaging the tissue, causing it to become inflamed and painful. So you start taking the antibiotics. So you go home, you take it for a few days. Well, a few days later, you probably start to feel better. Your throat doesn't hurt anymore. <clears throat> so do you throw the rest of your prescription away? No, no. No. What will the doctor always tell you to do, Brandon? Right? Yes, to finish the prescription. Okay, like ten days is for a lot of antibiotics. It's a ten-day prescription. Why do they make you keep taking? If you feel better, why should you keep taking it? You know, generally people say you shouldn't take medicine if you don't need it. So why do you keep taking it? Okay. Sophia? Okay, yeah, you're on the right track, Rosemary. It could come back. Yeah, why can it come back? So you take it for three days, say, oh, I feel better, I throw it away. What has happened inside of your throat in that bacteria infection? Not all of it is gone. Right, after a few days. Which ones died first? The weakest ones, the ones that have no resistance to that antibiotic, those die off pretty quickly. <clears throat> Not a, another day, probably you've killed most of the medium strength ones. And so most of the bacteria are probably dead after a few days. And that's why you feel better. But what happens if you stop taking it, right? The bacteria that's left reproduces and that reproduces and that reproduces. Yeah, and now, so when you stop after three days, which ones are still alive in your throat, Matt? The strongest ones. The strongest ones, the ones with the most resistance. And so then if you stop taking it, then they're able to survive and 
reproduce and your infection could come back. But this time, how will that infection compare to the first time? I mean, Yeah, it's probably going to be worse because you you killed off the weakest and the medium bacteria, only the strong ones are left, then you stop taking. They start to reproduce, now you have an even worse infection. And now that same antibiotic might not work. Moxicillin might not kill it off because the ones that were left were pretty resistant to it. So you may, the doctor may switch you to a different antibiotic. So that's why it's important to take all of your prescriptions. It's really because of natural selection. The antibiotic is acting as nature selecting which bacteria can live and which can't. Now if you take all 10 days, chances are none of the bacteria are going to survive a full 10 days of that antibiotic. So after that, you've killed them. The same also happens with pesticides. Chemicals you spray on plants to kill insects. If you spray it for a while, you'll kill off the weakest, but you may leave the stronger ones and the most resistant, and they could then reproduce making another group of resistant pests, insects or whatever. Habib? What if they don't stop after 10 days? You just get another prescription bottle or you get a... If you still have the infection? Yeah. They usually would switch you to a different type of antibiotic because maybe the strep bacteria in your throat is a resistant form. And that's becoming a problem, is that more and more types of bacteria are becoming resistant to common antibiotics uh, for many reasons. Sometimes people say that they are overused, that doctors will give you an antibiotic before you actually need it. You know, sometimes people may go to the, the doctor and say, oh, I got this really bad cold, I need an antibiotic. But do you if you have a cold? No, because no. no, a cold's caused by a virus and antibiotics don't help it. But still, overuse of antibiotics just, again, kills off the weakest ones, leaving the stronger ones. Um, many animals are fed huge amounts of antibiotics in agriculture to prevent infections and um, to increase the yield in meat production and therefore um, a lot of antibiotics are used in agriculture as well. Another example, camouflage is a very common adaptation that many species have. And camouflage is sometimes used to avoid predators, to hide from predators, but also sometimes to sneak up on prey. Here's some examples. This is a flounder. You may know from uh, Little Mermaid has flounder in it, right? This is a different type of flounder. This one blends in, you can see the eyes up here, blends in almost perfectly with the background of the ocean that it's living in. These are ibixes. These are deer-like creatures uh, living in the Middle East, sort of rocky um, deserts, not quite desert areas. But you can see, here's one, here's another one, here's a third one. Yeah, so you see, they blend in the texture and coloration of their fur allows them to almost disappear into that background avoiding predators. Have you? I was reading an article and um, I think there were the IBCs were extinct somewhere in the 90s and then they got their DNA and they brought them back to life just a couple in 2003 but they didn't last as long. Oh really? It may be a certain variety of them. Yeah. I mean there's more than one type. They're doing that with the woolly mammoths. Yeah. <coughs> um, Apron moss again de developed camouflage you know from yesterday's activity. There's the light colored moth on the light background, very hard to see. There's the dark colored moth in the dark background. Candidate is an insect whose body is basically shaped just like a leaf. Yes. That's, part that's part of the that's part of the insect. Yeah. Even like a simple household cat has camouflage. Anyone see it? You do? No. Not really. I say my phone Anyone else? Where are you? Is it like yeah, it's right No. No. Anybody else find it? I think it's like up there. Up? No, a little down. Like there. I think that's it. That's the cat? Yeah. No.
again, peppery moss. This is the lichen that we talked about that covered many of the trees. And here you see that the, the light colored moth um, is pretty camouflaged in there. Although when the lichen is gone and the tree is just dark, obviously it doesn't blend in quite as well. Mimicry is another interesting evolutionary adaptation. Mimicry is when a species evolves to look like another species, kind of like a copycat. And sometimes a species evolves to look like another, sometimes to attract prey, or sometimes to discourage predators. What kind of snake this is? Anyone? Coral snake? Coral snake. It's deadly. A bite from the coral snake um, can kill a person. You can kill predators as well. So do you think, do many predators prey on coral snakes? No. No. Again, because of natural selection. Because what happens to predators that prefer coral snakes? They die. They die. Okay. This, however, is not a coral snake. That's a scarlet king snake. It's not poisonous at all. But it has evolved to have a pattern of coloration that mimics the coral snake. How is that helpful for the king snake? Kimberly? Yeah, other animals confuse it with the coral snake and they don't eat it. It doesn't exactly have the same coloration though. Does anybody know the rhyme that helps you remember the difference? My dad told me that, but I forgot it. I'm Peter? Red next to black, friendly jack. Yellow next to red, deadly fellow. Yeah, red next to yellow, you're a dead fellow. So red next to yellow, you're a dead fellow. Red next to black is a friend of Jack. Yeah. So, oh yeah, that's the difference. What's this? Uh, kind, you guys know this? Monarch. Yeah, that's a monarch butterfly. Monarch butterflies become poisonous after eating milkweed, so most, again, predators mostly uh, avoid eating monarchs. This is actually a viceroy butterfly, which mimics the color and pattern of the monarch, which again helps it survive because predators are less likely to eat it. Yeah? How come it becomes poisonous? What's that? How come it becomes poisonous? Because the, you know what milkweed is? Those plants, they go up to like break it, it has that white sticky stuff comes out, it's got those pods. Actually, that milky latex has poisons in it. Um, and as the monarchs eat milkweed, they integrate that poison into their own body tissue, making them poisonous as well. No, it doesn't affect them. They're able to metabolize it and store it in their tissue. Nope, not at all. But still, predators don't eat it because they mistake it for the monarch. Wait, so the ones that we often see in the monarch are? Usually a monarch. All right, last one. This is kind of a neat one. This is the bee orchid. So you can see this orchid is this purple flower, but the lower, you can see the lower leaf of the flower. This is a leaf of the flower. What's it look like? A bee. Yeah, it's got that fuzzy texture like a bee. And bees actually think that that's a female bee and are attracted to it and actually try to mate with the flower. In the process, spreading pollen from one flower to another. So this plant mimics bees to attract bees in to help spread its pollen from one flower to another. Another case of movement. All right, we're done with just about, but here are just some other neat examples. Many insects and other animals mimic leaves to blend in with their, this is the insect, that's its head, this is its body. That's the end. That's all insect. This is all its body. Wait, these, are its, yeah. these are its appendages. That's its head. Is that brown stuff that you usually see on the set, or is it body, or is that just over the No, that's just that's a coloration. 
That's again a Canada, that's its body. Yes. You want us to finish the other two pages? No. It's okay. Um, again, this is a little fish here, mimic seaweed, toad.